a hitting lesson from Rance Mullenix, watching kung fu movies with Gary Templeton and going to the zoo with Don Carmen. Uh, in the process of finding all the players but one, he discovered an astonishing range of experiences and untold stories in their post-baseball lives, and he realized that we all have more in common with ball players than we think. While crisscrossing the country, Baluchian retraced his own past, reconnecting with lost loves and coming to terms with his lifelong battle with obsessive compulsive disorder. Alternative, elegi alternatively elegiac and uplifting, the wax packs is part baseball nostalgic, nostalgia, part road trip travelogue, and all heart. A reminder that greatness is not found in the stats on the backs of baseball cards, but in the personal stories of the men on the front of it. Um, this is kind of my own interjection. The list of the players includes uh, some who are relatively unknown, like Jamie Kokenauer, who played four years ending in 1986 and compiling a 16 and 25 one loss record to a Hall of Famer, Carlton Fisk, and to someone who could have been a Hall of Famer, Doc Good. Brad is originally from Rhode Island. He is not a sports writer, but a biology professor at Merritt College in Oakland, California. He, he did not undertake his cross-country venture with a book contract in hand, I don't think, so had no assurance that the effort would end up with any sort of success, much less the su su success that his rightly received, and in fact, Brad had to endure 38 rejections before he found a publisher, Baseball's Friend, the University of Nebraska Press. Brad's a Phillies fan, and his favorite player is Don Carmen, who is one of the Wax Packers, Packers as we said. Uh, Carmen lasted 10 years, uh, eight with the Phillies, um, and the year of the Wax Pack was perhaps his best year. He was 10 and five with a 2.0 ERA, but his record overall is pretty mediocre. 53, 54, 411 ERA. So my first question to Brad is, as a Phillies fan, you had uh, quite a constellation of favorite players to pick from. Mike Schmidt, Steve Carlton, Chase Utley, Larry Boa, Ryan Howard. Why Don Carmen? <laughs> Well, thanks everyone for for being here and spending some time with me here and joining us. Um, yeah, why uh, Don Carmen? Well, basically because my whole um, my whole life I've never followed a crowd and I've always liked underdogs. And so, sure, you know, if you're a Phillies fan, the obvious um, favorites would be the people you mentioned. Growing up as a kid, I, I don't know why. Um, I focused on Carmen because uh, there's, you know, many, many underdogs to choose from on the Phillies. Um, Steve Lake, Bob Dernier, some of the names that come to mind. Um, but he was, you know, he was on the team in the era that I grew up in and something about him. I, mean, I think I always liked underdogs because I identified as one myself. I was a really shy kid. I got picked on a lot in school and kind of bullied. And so I think, subconsciously I probably identify with the guys that were not the star players um you know why Carmen in particular I don't really know but I think if you read the book and you read the chapter about or the, the chapters on Don Carmen what comes out is sort of it's uncanny how much I end up having in common with him once I get to know his his the story of his life beyond baseball so uh, I'm a scientist. I'm not one who's prone to say, oh, it was fate or it was meant to be. But things like this, you know, <laughs> challenge my scientific skepticism, to put it that way. I, I do have a quick question for you. Um, the uh, Honda Accord started out with 154,000 miles on it, and you drove almost 12,000 miles. You still have it? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's almost a year's <laughs> worth of driving in seven weeks. Um, I, I do. And then now the Honda now has like 250,000 miles on it. So 
uh, it's it's definitely well into its into extra innings by now. I don't think you can ever get rid of that. In fact, <laughs> people might offer you a lot of money for it with the way your books go. <laughs> for those, so I thought, Brad, just for those who uh, don't know who the players are, uh, I sort of held off when I read the book. I I wanted each chapter to be a little bit of a surprise, but. I, I thought it'd be a good idea to just kind of walk through where you drove and who you saw. Uh, you know, I, I can run through that quickly. I know you know it by heart, but uh, Rance Mullenix, just south of uh, Oakland. And then you went to L.A., Steve Yeager, uh, north of San Diego, Gary Templeton. Uh, Gary Pettis was um, hiding from you in Houston. Then uh, Randy Reddy in Dallas. You went to Camargo, Oklahoma, which was the hometown of Don. Uh, Lowell, Arkansas, Sarasota, Florida, where you tried to catch up with Carlton Fisk. Uh, then Naples to finally meet Don. Jacksonville to chase Vince Col Coleman. New York City. This is this is quite a uh, a venture. Uh, Lee Mazzelli, West, Westbury, New York, uh, Dwight Gid Gooden, um, Jr., not, not the pitcher, he dodged you, um, Norwood, Massachusetts, Richie Hebner, Car Cooperstown, Carlton Fisk, you finally caught him, uh, Rick Sutcliffe, all the way back in Las Vegas, and then uh, Al Cowan's hometown, um, Compton, California. It was actually, actually, Sutcliffe was in Kansas City, and then I stopped in Las Vegas. Oh, oh that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, so, I know that, other, that people have asked you this question, and I think it probably one we'd ask you, so I'll just go ahead and do it. Uh, it seems a natural in our day, in our era of sequels that man go just go get another wax pack from 1986 <laughs> and do this again in fact and get a get a cadillac or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, I know. Um, tell us your on that. well you know the sequel idea i mean i i know i'd have a lot of fun um and i get a lot of good stories if i did a sequel but i for my reason for not doing it is really more my role as a writer so my career i'm I have a strange career as a part-time biology professor and part-time writer. And I usually write about science in my journalism. Um, but um, to me, like the, my favorite type of writing is creative nonfiction, narrative nonfiction, which is what this book is. And to me, I just know that if I did a sequel, I, don't, I wouldn't believe in it to the extent that I believed in the original because the novelty's gone. Um, I think, you know, too much, too often people make the mistake of trying to replicate a success or trying to milk more out of it. And how, and so often the sequel is not as good, right? So the only reason this book, I was able to endure 38 rejections was because I truly never stopped believing in the vision that I had and the content of what I could produce. And if I'm being honest with myself, which is, you know, one of the themes of the book is learning how to be honest with ourselves and our lives. I could say, I could not honestly say that I would believe in that a sequel could match the original, given that a big part of the, this book is also my story. And my story is now already told. I mean, it's been five years, but not that much has happened in my life in five years that would make it interesting enough for all of you guys. So, you know, I think writers make the mistake of being overly self-indulgent and not knowing when to say, no, that's not a good idea, or no, that's not going to be as good. So, uh, so my, my rationale for the sequel, yeah, maybe it I would be able to get a contract much easier, I'd make more money, but that's not what motivates me as primarily as a, as a creator or a writer. And so therefore, I have other book ideas, other writing ideas, but I just don't think it would be quite the same the second time around. Yeah. Did so when you were reaching out to these ball players, you you were not a, a published author, uh, at least in baseball. 
right. and sort of an un, complete unknown. And you you didn't have a contract at the time. Right. It was like, I, you know, build it and they will come type idea. Did you think that made it easier to get into some of these people as opposed to somebody from the national press who they might have been more intimidated or nervous that uh, some of their uh, thoughts and, and private life might be used in a bad way? It's a good question. Um, and I, I know you, Tad, understand that I read your email about the, your Ron Hunt work, which I think is a great story. Um, so you know what it's like to approach somebody and have them be a little bit, you know, not not accommodating at first. Um, but, but yeah, I think it worked. I think in the long run, it was better that I didn't have those connections. Um, it, it, you know, it made it harder maybe to get my foot in the door because I couldn't say, hey, I'm Bob Costas and, you know, and then already have like that name recognition. <clears throat> but part of my approach to each of the guys when I contacted them and ultimately met up with them, and I was really surprised, pleasantly surprised at how many were willing to talk to me. Uh, when I got face to face with them, I was very upfront about saying like, I'm I'm different than most writers who have who have, you've probably talked to, in that, um, you know, if I'm talking to Liam Bazzilli, I'm not going to really ask you about the 1986 World Series because uh, I know and, and I know because I know how you feel about it. I I know what you're going to say. I mean, all these guys, they get asked the same questions and they have these responses that are ready to go. You know, so that's not interesting to me creatively. So. I would be very, I would go to each guy and I would say, look, I'm not a sports writer and I'm interested in you more as a person than as a player. Um, and I would do this thing where I had this big thick file that I had, you know, I had done my homework and that was something that I think they respected was I had spent nine months before the trip researching all of these guys and compiling a big thick file on all their the articles written about them and their baseball career. So I knew their, I knew what was published inside and out and I'm, made it known that I had done my homework. And I would say, you know, I've read this whole file on you, Steve Yeager, and I feel like I know nothing about you, which kind of caught them off guard, like, oh. <laughs> and then I would say, like, I know you've been trained to say nothing of substance to me because like the famous Bull Durham scene and cliche, right? Where the, all these guys are, they're trained, just like Don Carmen famously, put in his locker many years ago, you know, the 37 cliches that you say to the press of, you know, yeah, I'm going to take it one day at a time and all yeah. that. So I would basically like try to preempt all of that by just putting it all on the table and saying, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm focusing more on understanding who you are as a person on what happened after you were done playing. And also I was honest about being willing to share my own story. So I would say like, if I'm going to ask you about your relationship with your, with your dad or your divorce, I'll tell you about the mistakes that I've made and the things, you know, I mean, I'm going to be as vulnerable as I want you to be. And I think all of that coupled with the fact that I really tried to get these guys out of a traditional interview environment. So rather than saying, Hey, meet me for one hour at a coffee shop where we stare at each other with a tape recorder right in between, like we're having some kind of standoff, you know, I would say, let's meet at an art museum or the zoo or let's go bowling or let's watch Kung Fu movies or let's do a hitting lesson. Like all these different activities that I did with the players, which was because I, for, I did that because I knew it would make them more comfortable just being in, in an activity. And also for the reader's sake, as a writer, again, it was the way of the type of writing that I do it's like I'm interviewing you, but I'm also writing down in my notes what you look like, what clothes you're wearing, what's happening in the background, what the environment is like. So if I could do that in all these different places, I knew that for the reader, it would be a lot more entertaining to read about than if I just said, you know, if I just quoted whatever you're saying. Well, and I, and I would say, um, Brad, your style of writing um, is... Um, not the farthest thing from purple journal journalism you you i mean and and i i mean there's a compliment that these people have sort of let you into their home and um open themselves up to you and you, it's not like you're going after some kind of 
uh, oh, I discovered this bad thing about him. It's just, it's just a more personal portrait. Have you, have you gotten much feedback from the players? Yeah, um, the players, so all the guys that I talked to have received a copy and most of them have said they've at least read, they're, you know, they're kind of funny, like Randy Reddy was like, oh, I read my chapter three times, but <laughs> not necessarily <laughs> everybody else's. Uh, so it ranges from that to Don Carmen, again, who's such an exceptional guy in so many ways, actually liked, I mean, he, when he got the book, he, he actually we actually formed our own book club where we actually had a phone conversation about every single chapter as he read it. That was how interested he was in the process and um, the, you know, the book in general. So, I mean, I asked a couple of guys asked me, you know, can you, could you take this out? But they were very minor things. Um, and to your, to your point, you know, I think people were drawn to journalism for different reasons. Some people it's, it's the investigative part, you know, and, and, there's, and there's a need for all these different types. You know, for me, my, my primary motivation in journalism is, is telling, telling a story. And it's not about, you know, uncovering some deep truth or doing that investigative work. So, uh, so yeah, so that's what kind of informs my approach to how I write is I was trying to earn their trust at the same time i was not trying to dig up dirt on them or you know as you were saying kind of like nail them on anything okay um so i think as i told you i'm a i'm a st louis cardinal fan and there were two chapters in this that uh i went to right away just because they're they involved two of the more controversial St. Louis Cardinal players in, in the last 40 or 50 years. Um, and one was Gary Templeton. Uh, you can kind of set the backstory on that, but it, from my perspective, and I followed them closely, there was, you know, a bad situation. Whitey Herzog was a hero in, in St. Louis, and they got rid of Templeton. And when they did, it was like, this guy was going to be a Hall of Famer, and you got Ozzy Smith. Um, and then, you know, Templeton had a pretty respectable career after that. He was injured a lot, but we never heard from him again. And then you sort of tell his side of the stories. I mean, I, I, that was very fascinating. Could you kind of expand on that a little bit? Yeah. And, you know, I can't speak for, I wasn't, maybe some of you guys were following the Cardinals in 1981. I was one year old. So I, I obviously, you know, can't um, speak for what it was like to follow them all those years. And I'm sure there are many sides to the story um, for the people that lived through it. Uh, I'm not saying that Carl, that um, Templeton was a, was a saint, but from what I, from the research that I could do sort of, you know, retrospectively, reading the media accounts and then talking to Templeton about it, it was clear to me that there was at least a large part of that particular incident where, so this is the incident in 1981 in August where he's, he was, um, he was hurt. His knee was bothering him. And basically he, Whitey Herzog told him, look, if you, if you, um, are, you know, run out of routine, if you're, if you hit a routine ground ball, don't hurt yourself getting to first base. And so in the game, when he hit a ground ball, he basically didn't go all out. You know, he's kind of stopped running. And, but he, you know, he had been given the blessing, according to him, for, by, by Herzog. And then uh, as a result, some of the fans at the game, and it was not a, a well-attended game. And the attendance was like 7,000. And, you know, so you know that it was probably pretty quiet. And... Um, these fans came down to the front rail and started yelling all these racial slurs at him. I mean, things that were so bad that even when I asked him about it, he wouldn't repeat, you know, I mean, he, they were saying the N word and he said that they got worse than that, which I don't know how you could get much worse than that, but you know, he wouldn't even share with me exactly what was said even years later. So in response, he basically turned to the crowd and, you know, grabbed his crotch and flipped them off. Um, which, led to his ejection and the whole scene where Whitey kind of hauls him into the dugout and then it's on the papers the next day. And then everything that's reported in the, I mean, he immediately gets suspended, sent to a psychiatric facility for evaluation. And the way it's reported is basically that he was, you know, just completely out of line. 
and, um, you know, had some kind of major mental issue. And then when, uh, when in the book, Templeton kind of tells his whole side of that story, which is that, you know, his teammates and Whitey clearly heard what was being said that provoked Templeton. And yet in all the media accounts, there's no mention, first of all, that Whitey told him, you know, don't, don't hurt yourself getting to first base, but also that what provoked him were all these racial slurs. And so to me, again, just reading how it was reported in the media, it seemed very unfair that that part wasn't included. Also that, um, you know, when he went to the psychiatric facility, he ended up, he ended up, uh, telling the press that he had been diagnosed with severe depression and had to take medication and all this. And when he tells the story, he basically said he went into this facility and played ping pong all day. And then, he, you know, he didn't have a mental illness or disorder. He was just, you know, acting out because he was angry at being called the N word. So the way that that was whole, all handled, I just think it, it just talks, it just, you realize what a different time it was 40 years ago in baseball and the culture of baseball. You know, and this comes out as a theme, not only in that chapter, but in Al Cowan's chapter about what it was like to be a black player in the 70s, you know, in different parts of the country. And even Lee Mazzilli talks about this when here's a kid who grew up in Brooklyn and his whole life. And then his first minor league assignment is down in like in South Carolina sometime. And he said, you know, he goes down there and it's like this is the early mid 70s and he's never seen this part of the country. And, you know, there's as he describes it, you know, chain gangs on the side of the road, and there's all this culture shock. So again, it, it, you know, just, I think when it comes to race and baseball, we talk a lot about integration and Jackie Robinson, but we don't talk as much about like all those years later where it was still really tough for black players in the seventies to, to, you know, uh, to be treated the same. Um, so that's kind of the, the story on Templeton. Yeah. And, and, there are many ball players who get traded around and it's because they're bad influences and they have stuff like that happen over and over again. He got traded to San Diego and he was a model citizen. So yeah. that sort of is the, to me, it's sort of the uh, uh, final tale on this young guy that, you know, made a mistake for sure, but, but uh, got beat up on it for it and shipped out of town and, and made a real, um, um, got a lot of criticism. He really wasn't that bad a guy. And well, it's also he, that you, you, real, you realize that if that happened in 2020, not only I think would there be a more fair treatment, but there'd be more opportunities to tell the whole story, right? Would, I mean, yeah. There's a lot that I don't like about social media and all of that, but there's a lot more, there are a lot more outlets for people's voices. Back then, you know, you either, it was reported on three TV stations, your local newspaper, and that was it. That was the, yeah, that they was the hauled, media, They know? would have hauled the guys out of the stadium. I mean, in, in, in no time. Uh, and his teammates probably would have backed him up, would have backed him up. Yeah. Uh, the other guy is Vince Vincent Coleman, Vince Coleman, who you know was a speedster for the Cardinals in the '80s, and um, uh, I like the name you apply to him, <laughs> Vincent Van Gaughan. He never would meet up with. Him. Yeah. Yeah, Vince is kind of like. I mean, I think what you know people ask me. Um, Am I disappointed I didn't get to talk to all the players? And at the time I was, but in reality, I think the book is better because of it. Because I don't get to talk to Vince and I, you know, barely talk to Fisk and Gooden kind of disappears on me. It, it create, I mean, every, I mean, again, the, the objective of this book is for it to be a narrative and an engaging narrative and entertaining. And, and in order to have that, you have to have dramatic tension and conflict and characters. And if everyone's a good guy, it's kind of boring, right? So, I mean, Vince kind of ends up as like one of the villains of the book um, because, you know, with the other guys that wouldn't talk to me, like with Gooden, his story to me is more sad than it, than it is that he was a jerk. You know, he just has his demons. With Vince Coleman, he just flat out wouldn't talk to me and showed no interest in talking to me. And then in 
kind of researching his career, you know, there's all these examples of where he kind of is hostile to the media and the fans and just not a very good track record. Um, and so uh, for, you know, for Vince, it always, you know, with Vince, it always seemed like he, he wanted so badly to be accepted and to be recognized and to fit in. And he just, you know, it was always trying too hard. So just tone deaf and, um, and always, and again, not being honest with himself, he thought he was a better player than he was. Um, and so, uh, that chapter is about me going to Jacksonville where he grew up and finding his neighborhood and actually finding the house he grew up in and going to his high school and his church and talking to people that knew him and his family. Um, so I think it's still fun. It's interesting and entertaining, but it's, um, it's more the story of like, you know, he's, he's not there actively in it. It's just me reporting about him. Yeah, I thought that you couldn't have done better if you'd interviewed him because if he'd, you know, given you a little time, he probably would not have um, given uh, any real personal information. He'd just probably talk about how he got screwed and how great he, he was. Right. Um, you got and you kind of looked at his background um i think i told you that i listened to the Derek gould podcast and those guys cardinal uh sports writers are very familiar with coleman and they when you talked about him they sort of said been there done that <laughs> yeah uh one of the themes that you have uh throughout this which is uh well done and it's, you know, it's sort of a common theme, but not uh, sort of done in a cross country way like you did. And then you, and then you have your own personal story as father, son. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, and that wasn't actually part of the plan initially. Um, you know, I, so one of, I've been very vocal on Twitter and, and in interviews about talking about and being very honest about the process of writing a book and sharing, and sharing that. And, um, you know, as I, as you said in the beginning, it was really hard. I spent the reason why I took five years from the trip to get it published was because I got rejected 38 times. And, um, and I found that publishers are very, you know, very risk averse. You know, I, I, I they kept, wanting i mean publishers want certainty they want to know with as much certainty as they can have that this is going to be a bestseller or this is going to sell so many copies and, and to do that they want to know exactly what the book's going to be about right and and everyone now wants like you to solve the world's problems with some big idea that's transcendent in your book and for me it was like okay the the, the book in the in the conception was well what happens after you're done playing baseball but I always knew that, you know, if I had a chance to get out there and do this, other things were going to come up. I mean, sometimes you don't know the story until you go get it, right? <laughs> right? And the father-son thing is one of those examples where I didn't know that half these guys were going to have fathers that were abusive or had run out on them or they never knew them. Um, but as I got on the road and it's like, oh, Steve Yeager, your dad passed out in the clubhouse because he was so drunk the first time he went to see you play in Cincinnati. And Oh, Randy Reddy, your dad built you a pitching mound through one pitch and walked off and he never played with you again. And then Don Carmen, sort of the, even the, the, the height of this, you know, you hated your dad so much that when he got into a car accident in your front yard, you hoped he would die. I mean, these are things that are intense and emotional that I, I'm grateful these guys were, were willing to share with me, but I had no idea. You're not going to read about that reading the Associated Press article from 1986 about the Cardinals, right? So um, as these themes emerged, I realized, wow, this is like, this isn't just coincidence. From a random pack, there are patterns that are emerging. And one of them is the relationship with your father. Um, now, they weren't all bad. I mean, Rance Mullenix's dad was like a saint and, you know, Lee Mazzilli's father. And so it, as I went on the trip, I also realized because the book was also about me as sort of the connective tissue with all these guys that telling the story of my relationship with my dad was now potentially relevant. And, you know, it's a good relationship, but it's, it's got issues. Um, and so I was able to work my dad into the narrative such that he was actually there with me when I was interviewing Lee Mazzilli. 
Um, so yeah, the father son thing is, um, is definitely, I mean, it's part of baseball. It's also, um, you know, it's, it's a huge part of this book. You know, the, um, to me, uh, maybe my favorite part of the book is, uh, when you just sort of decide, I'm just going to bear my soul to my father. <laughs> yeah. And, and I don't, I don't know, you, you didn't give any editorial, uh, I don't think remarks to his response, but his one line response to that to me was just, I'm not going to say it because, uh, people ought to read it. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. And I read, I, I, I took that response as both. I have, I have children in my, tw in their twenties and, and I had a, you know, a, um, a, a good but not great relationship with my father and it was it was just seemed really neat mm -hmm. yeah no that's actually a really good way to describe it that's how I felt too in that um you know I don't have kids but I think if you have kids if you are a father uh that whole scene gets at at this point that I think that when it's like, I've always been surprised that I never, like my parents or you know, my dad never seems as mad at me as I can get at him. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's sort of asymmetry because there have been times where I'll like unload on him and he'll just sort of be like remarkably cool about that. And he's never as mad at me. And then you realize that that's because be, when you're the parent, you know, you've seen this person at their most vulnerable as a little infant. And so there's something about that, that, power dynamic that makes it impossible for I think for the father to be as angry at the son as the son can be at the father and and so in that scene where I am sort of bare my soul my dad's reaction was a little bit unexpected but it, it gets at what you're what we're talking about that that idea of the the difference in the in the power dynamic um I wanted so there's a couple of people that have written questions in the chat here I just want to address okay, that. Yeah. someone That's said so um what was the what was like the inspiration or light bulb moment for the the pack or the book it was really um <clears throat> realizing that number one that to me a, a pack just looks like a book like it's like 15 cards in a pack 15 chapters in a book so there was something about the physical pack that re resembled a book to me and then i i knew that if i wanted to write about the guys from that i grew up with there would be no better way. I mean, unless you're going to write a book about a team or, you know, where you have the players pre-selected, there's no better way to get a, a, a good sample of 15 players than, than a pack. Cause it gives you this random sample, which I think one of the, one of the themes of the book is that you can only control so much in your life, you know, that we, as as a society, we're, we we always crave security and certainty and control, but really we can't control. You know, we can't. We can only control our behavior and our reaction to things. So much of what happens in life is beyond our control. What I like about the pack is that you're you're relinquishing control to the pack. You're saying, okay, pack, whatever fifteen guys are in there, those are going to be my guys, versus me hand picking fifteen players because I think they're interesting or that sort of thing. Um, so, so yeah, that was just a, a nice device to get the players for the book. Um, someone else asked me, uh, who, who's the biggest jerk that I interviewed? Well, actually the guy of the guys that I met, they were, none of them were jerks. Um, they all were really great. I mean, clearly, you know, Coleman blew me off and Fisk blew me off. Um, so, you know, um, I hate to judge someone not having really met them and spent time with them, but I was disappointed in those guys. Um, uh, McFarland did not reject the book because uh, I had initially gone to the, what they call the big five publishers, which are the five companies in New York that control all the imprints that, that can actually give decent size advances. And so that's where most of my rejections were. Um, <clears throat> although some smaller presses like Triumph rejected it. Uh, and then my second agent said, um, uh, well, I think we've reached the end of the road. And I said, no, I don't think so. So we, we broke up and I ended up going right to Rob Taylor at university of Nebraska. 
and he was great. He was like, yes, this is, I love this. Let's do it. So interestingly, I didn't even end up having an agent on the book, which is um, maybe a little unusual. Uh, <clears throat> what else people ask? Did I consider a different writing style? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, no, because for me, the, the way that I like to write is as a, in creative nonfiction, that's how I was trained in, in journalism, doing magazine journalism. But you could write a book based on a pack of cards in many different styles. It would that could be very different from the narrative style. Um, and my what are my favorite baseball books? Um, so <clears throat> stylistically, in terms of the the type of writing that I enjoy reading the most, Boys of Summer, The Teammates, Stolen Season, those are the books that are kind of similar to mine that I really enjoy. In terms of books that are really more purely about baseball. I really like um, Jason Turbo's books. You know, he's, I've gotten to know several baseball writers because we formed this pandemic baseball book club where all, the, all of us with book, baseball books affected by the pandemic have come together. And it's been, it's really this really neat story where, you know, people that are ostensibly competitors are now coming together and promoting each other. And it's like this really nice example of cooperation that came about through these weird circumstances with the pandemic, but um, it's, uh, um, it's been really nice to see. Um, someone said, uh, were the more obscure players more willing to talk? I, I would say, yeah, guys that were, I mean, that's another theme is that the, the more famous the player, the, the harder they were to get to. And, and I think actually, unfortunately, the less well-adjusted they are in their lives. I mean, look at the most, successful baseball players, Gooden and Fisk, they, you know, their lives are, I would not say that they seem like terribly happy people <laughs> in their late life. Whereas Jaime Kokenauer, the most obscure player is probably the most well-adjusted, happy guy in life in general. Um, did Whitey Herzog publicly defend Gary Templeton? Um, no, not as far as I can tell, he did the opposite. He was basically said, this guy needs to grow up. And until he grows up, he's not back on the team. So that, that's, what I remember, that's what I remember from my research on that. I think so that's two, the questions. Two yeah. of the, two of the uh, guys who had reputations as good guys and uh, that proved to be true. Hebner and Sutcliffe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I really like those chapters. Um, and especially Sutcliffe. I've, I've always loved his announcing style and sort of his approach. Um, you found them to be real. Yeah, I mean, Sutcliffe is probably just, I mean, unfiltered in the best way. Just, you know, he just so candid. Um, so... I love that about, I mean, one of the greatest things that Sutcliffe said was that he, when he finished playing, he had a job opportunity to be the pitching coach, I think for the, was it the Padres? I have to go back to the book and, and remember. And he said, he told the general manager, he turned down pitching for the pod, I mean, being the pitching coach for the Padres to go coach at like rookie ball in some small town for $20,000, right? And then said that that was the greatest experience of his professional career or his coaching career. Um, so to me, that says a lot about Rick Sutcliffe, you know, that it, it wasn't about the money, it wasn't about the prestige, it was about the, the people and the experience. Um, everything about Sutcliffe is about just compassion, humanity, just being a good guy. Um, and Richie Hebner, yeah, I felt like of all the guys, he was, I didn't get as, as much from him, but I think it's because it was the middle of the season. He was a hitting coach. It was a game day. And Richie, I think, you know, if you could get Richie comfortable for a long period of time, he, he could fill 10 books worth of sto good stories. But he is definitely a little more guarded. And I think that chapter is also because I went and talked to his brother and I kind of talk about, um, you know, how Richie kind of seems like he's, not as comfortable maybe opening up about being as vulnerable. I mean, he's a very fun, 
guy, uh, very personable, but he's not maybe as willing to be vulnerable as other guys I talked to. Um, someone asked, uh, what was the biggest surprise? Um, the biggest surprise was what I was talking about earlier when guys like Steve Yeager would volunteer that his father passed out in the clubhouse. He was so drunk the first time he watched him play. And again, by asking about <clears throat> their things that they may not have expected me to ask about, like their relationships with, with their dad and that sort of thing, a lot of personal stuff came out in those conversations. Um, Someone asked, do I have any plans to write other baseball books? Um, nothing like imminently, but to me, the what, what, what attracts me to baseball, you know, so I, to me, baseball is this perfect blend of art and science. You know, the, the analytics world is all about, you know, logic and information and science. And, and then the other part of baseball is, is the emotion and the feel, which is a necessary part. And, um, to me, I'm more interested in the, in the, in the art part. And I mean, which is ironic because I'm a scientist, but I get enough science in that part of my life. I'm interested in the emotions of baseball. And so if I did another baseball book, it would be something that would probably be done in a similar vein, looking more at the emotional side than the analytics side. Um, someone asked to talk about my OCD. Yeah. So OCD um, is an anxiety disorder. <clears throat> People sometimes ask me, <clears throat> have I cured my OCD? And the answer is I, I will never cure my OCD because as long as this head is attached to my shoulders, I will have OCD. It's just a, a particular type of brain chemistry. Um, but what I can, what I have been able to do is learn how to manage it the same way someone who has diabetes will probably always have diabetes, but they know how to manage it with their insulin. Right? So, um, it has not disrupted my life in a, in a long time, but I, I have to always be very vigilant about the toolbox that I have to manage OCD because I could easily, you know, go back into a have it affect me more. Um, OCD is, is simply uh, a, uh, a pattern where the OCD brain, when you have an irrational thought, most people just dismiss it and the OCD brain reacts to it as if it is a real threat. And then you do some kind of behavior mentally or, or, or behavior, you know, sort of uh, in a more extroverted way, obvious way to try to uh, neutralize your, your irrational fear. And that's the compulsion. Every time you do the compulsion, you reinforce the obsessive irrational fear. And it's this terrible feedback loop that ends up, leading you to become very paralyzed and kind of depressed. And the only way to break that cycle is to expose yourself to the irrational fear without engaging in the compulsion to neutralize it. So the therapy that I talk about in the book that I went through, um, so for example, um, someone, a common type of OCD fear is that people are worried they're going to harm a loved one or like they're going to, they're going to stab their baby or something. So to, to get through that, you have to actually work up to holding a knife in front of your baby and realizing you're not going to stab the baby, which I know sounds very extreme and maybe odd, but you're basically desensitizing your brain to its irrational thoughts. And the more that you do that, the more you are able to tolerate the, the anxiety that comes with those thoughts. So that's a sort of mechanistic way to describe OCD. Um, ultimately, it was helpful for me to share that in the book because I thought what um, baseball players were really good about was knowing how to, how, having a, a good relationship with fear in that in order to be successful in baseball, you have to not only um, coexist with fear, but almost welcome it in. And otherwise, if, if you can't do that, you're not going to be a successful baseball player. Um, and someone said, oh, do I recognize OCD in the players? Um, no, but I recognize that they had, they had, as I was just saying, kind of mastered some of them without even realizing it, how to deal with fear. Because when you play baseball, 
you know, fear is just a, a huge part of the game because you're going to fail most of the time. And so if you don't understand how to sort of accept that failure and let it go, you're not going to last very long, which is why everyone says, you know, the mental part of baseball is so important. Um, did anyone tell me that certain subjects were off limits? Uh, no, but there were a couple times where I, they told me like, this is off the record. So when Dennis Hebner shared some of the details about his, his fight with his brother or his disagreement, he didn't want me to publish that. And I honored that. Or when Randy Reddy was telling me about details of his divorce, he said that was off the record. So, um, those were some times when I, I did not, um, you know, I, I honored their request. Uh, how, when and how did I get hooked on baseball? Uh, so really it was, it was my dad growing up, you know, my dad's in the book and I talk about how at a young age, he would introduce me to baseball cards and box scores and all of that. And, uh, you know, often I think we, we tend to follow what our dads are interested in. So that's how I got interested in that. And I did play through little league, but again, I was actually, <laughs> What I, I, I loved base running and fielding, but hitting was my, I hated hitting because it was too much, too much pressure. It was too much fear. <laughs> so I, I know I, was, I would not have been a good major league baseball player because I did not understand how to handle fear in, in baseball. I see, it seems to me that uh, there is maybe some overtones. Maybe, maybe you recognize maybe a little bit more uh, tendencies in baseball because everybody is so uh even with fans um there have been a couple players who i think have uh had issues like that that are more notable i think tony horton who was a cleveland indian in the in the 60s and then jimmy pearsall who was a pretty famous ball player who was felled um there was an author who wrote a book, um, Robert Coover, uh, it was about a guy who invented a board game, baseball game, who essentially abandoned his entire life hmm. to get immersed in the ball game. And with all the statistics and, and now we're just adding more onto them, um, sometimes it feels like people are go overboard on that. Well, I think, I mean, I think baseball, yeah, I mean, and baseball fans tend to be super analytical and, and maybe borderline obsessive, which, you know, in like everything in moderation is a good thing. I mean, my, the good parts of my OCD is like, makes me a really good scientist, right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's, um, there's good, I mean, as long as you know that you, the OCD, you control the OCD, it's not controlling you. It could be uh a, an asset. Um, Rance Mullenix gave me a hitting lesson and um, what I learned, so Rance grew up in the Charlie Lau school of hitting. So, you know, who was this guru in the seventies and taught George Brett and all these guys in the Royals. And one thing that I didn't know, like when he showed me the swing is that I was just surprised. I always thought and I was never really trained, but, in little league, I thought, you know, when you, when you hit, you want to just sort of stride forward and have your weight coming forward. And he did this, showed me this thing where he almost kind of did this little tap and kind of put his weight back at first. And that, that was something that I never knew about hitting. At least that's how he hit. That was kind of neat. Um, there's a, uh, while I'm chatting, I could probably, I'll, I'll put a link in here to this video. So I, I didn't really take video on the on the road trip um except for one video and see if i can bring that up here uh yeah so i'll put this link in the chat if you want to watch rance mullenix at that hitting lesson explaining to me how to hit you can watch this later on so take a look at that later on good deal um so someone said um have i come to louisville so actually the sad thing about this is i was supposed to be on this 35 stop book tour right now that i was supposed to go to louisville <laughs> uh, i've been to frankfurt for for several days i love frankfurt um but uh 
yeah, I, you know, hopefully I can do a book tour next year and I would love to come through Louisville um, if that happens. Well, uh, let us know. We'll help, we'll help with it. And I know, um, you know, the, you know, the bookstores are all closed right now, but uh, it's kind of opened up this virtual meeting stuff that maybe some of your um, ability to get the word out has been made easier. Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely been, you know, there's definitely trade-offs. Um, with the, the effects of all this. Um, it's been, you know, people might have more time to read. On the other hand, 40 million people have lost their jobs. So there's maybe less disposable income. So, you know, it's who knows in a non-pandemic world how this would be doing, but I think it's doing well considering the circumstances. We had a member ask, uh, he, I guess he got the audio book and you, you actually narrated that, correct? Yeah, it's weird. I was actually in LA taping that when the pandemic really like the shutdown really began which was very bizarre it was like and and taping an audiobook is nor is incredibly hard I, I have a new respect for anyone who does voice acting because you sit there for seven hours in a in a booth about eight feet wide and every single time you shift in your seat you have to re re-record because the microphones are so sensitive it picks up everything so it was exhausting. I mean, it was fun. I, I'm glad I did it. But um, in the middle of all that, I w it, it, the the world was coming undone. So it was a it was a surreal time to be doing that. Yeah, yeah. So how uh, you you the book is climbing the charts, right? Yeah, it's um you know what's nice. Oftentimes with a book, um, it it has its peak when it first comes out, and then it kind of declines and because I'm from a small press, I don't have um, a big marketing budget. You know, my advance was $2,000 for this book. So <laughs> I wasn't getting rich on the, the six years it took to, to, to write it. But as the word of mouth goes out um, and it's getting a lot of good press, like last weekend, a friend of mine emailed me and said, oh, you're in the LA Times bestseller list this week, which was, shot. I had no idea. I mean, I was, and I was so overjoyed to see that. Um, so it's nice to see the book kind of gaining momentum over time versus losing steam. Yeah, one of the the only ball player who is deceased was Al Callens, and you told the story about Jim Farmer uh, hitting Ed him Farmer. in the face. Ed Farmer, yeah, yeah, Ed Farmer hitting him in the face, and uh, the next season it put him out for the season. Um, next season he. And he hit a ground ball instead of running to first. He ran. <laughs> I went back and looked at that video, and of course oh, really? the cam camera doesn't follow Cowens. They follow the ground ball to short, and they follow the ball thrown over to first. And the first baseman catches it and takes off for the mound. And then there's a big scrum. Uh, at, I mean, it was a brawl. But at the very end, the last person who was screaming and yelling standing on third base was none other than Richie Hebb. <laughs> oh wow! I didn't. He, know that. He, yeah, he was a uh, he was on uh, he was a tiger, I guess, uh, in that in that fight. It's, it's interesting that you bring up that. I, I actually would like to. I didn't know that was online, but um, the, you know that the, the camera followed the ball. So that was that came up in the Carlton Fist chapter, and I don't know if people have heard this story, but the iconic moment when Fisk hits the home run and is doing the wave was yeah. purely by accident that that was captured on tape because up until that point, the, um, the cameramen were told to always follow the action, follow the ball. And so the cameraman who had his camera that ca captured that, the only reason why he got that was because right when Fisk hit the ball, a rat jumped on his leg. And so he stayed with the shot of Fisk instead of going to the ball. And as a result, he captured arguably the most iconic shot in baseball history and changed, really changed the way that um, video editors approach their, their job. And they realized that like having, yeah, you have to have a one camera follow the ball, but having cameras on the players for reaction shots is just as important as following the action. Um, so that was kind of a neat story that, you know, in, nowadays you would have definitely had a camera that would have captured 
Al Cowan's punching Ed Farmer. <laughs> yeah. Um, did I hear you right? Did you say did I, did you say a rat? A rat. Yeah. So oh, so, so the guy, the the cameraman was inside the green monster, shooting through the the hole there, and on home plate, and then a rat <laughs> jumped on his leg, and he was distracted. So that's <laughs> that's why he that's why he got the shot of Fisk. Great story. Um, someone said, any living player that I would like to interview? Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of guys. I mean, probably <laughs> the guys that I would like to interview. Uh, you know, in, in keeping with the book, it would be not the star players. Like there are many more guys that I, from that era that I like, like Marty Barrett and someone like uh, Dane Orge or Steve Lake. Uh, you know, um, I had a lot of guys that I, that I just, the, always the journeyman guys that I would love to interview um, because those are the guys that I always like the most. Anybody have any more questions? Chime in. You can speak up or send the chat. Well, Brad, you've been very generous. Oh, here we go. Oh, thanks, Roger. <laughs> uh, you've been very generous with your time, and I know you have been uh, generally with, um, you know, the other chapters, and um, and I've listened in and, and watched one of them and you do a really good job at this you really well, thank uh, you. you're a good interview <laughs> i mean I, i'm only uh i mean the book's only successful because people like you guys have supported it so you know that's to me it's 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 an obvious thing to to talk to people as much as i can it's a great book and uh, uh the bookstores are closed but amazon i'll give you a good deal on it and uh and get it to you pretty quickly that's right well, thanks everyone. I appreciate it. And, um, you know, so if you ever want to talk on, I'm pretty active on Twitter at Waxpack Book um, or email me. All my information is pretty easy to find. So happy to, happy to interact. All right. Thank you very much. Good, good to talk to you. All right. Thanks everyone. Take care.